<laughs> Goodness, I'd think I was in a Church of England, you know, with a pulpit and a lectern. <laughs> No, I, I'm kidding. Uh, almost. <laughs> hey, it's great to see everybody. And uh, I have been occupied with vacation Bible schools and writing this week. And I just got here at noon today. So um, I'm sorry I've missed all this good material. And wow, I enjoyed the singing and enjoyed the music. Wow. Uh, and uh, that, that's really wonderful. And uh, thank the Lord for all of you. Thank Brother Hutchcraft for his kind introduction. He's a very fine student and uh, serves the Lord and everybody appreciates him. Well, I'm uh, delighted today that we can open up one of my very favorite books of the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah. Now, my favorite book of the Old Testament is whatever one I happen to be currently studying. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Jeremiah is a super favorite book of mine. And I haven't been here before, so if I say something somebody else has already said, I don't have a clue that I'm doing it. So, uh, so I'm not concerned anyway. Uh, like Paul, uh, to, for me to say the same things is not irksome. Uh, it, just doesn't irk, it just doesn't irk me at all to repeat what somebody else has said. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'd like to read the passage from Jeremiah, and I'm going to be referring to uh, some of the surrounding passages. Of Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 31 to 34. Now, you've no doubt heard this several times. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new commitment, a new promised arrangement, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now here he is referring to the covenant at Mount Sinai. Uh, he's not alluding here to the covenant with Abraham, uh, which is quite a different thing. We are heirs and the fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham. Uh, the law of Moses was added as a beneficial but temporary arrangement. Uh, and uh, so he says, not according to my covenant that I made with them when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And I want you to notice that the Israelites did not go out by their own choice. They went out by the election of God. And by the power of God, who loved them, though they did not deserve his love, and who did not always appreciate his love. In fact, I'm not sure they ever appreciated it. But he loved them anyway. I have loved you, he said in Hosea, with an everlasting love. And in that respect, since we serve the same God as the Israelites served, we are also heirs of that everlasting love. Uh, and it is an everlasting love. He says, I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. Now, of course, that's somewhat of an allusion to Hosea. Uh, Hosea was told to go and take a wife of harlotry, of whoredom. And she was a heartbreak to Hosea. Very much a big heartbreak. Whopper hop heartbreak. And Israel was sort of a heartbreak to God. But out of Israel there came a remnant of the seed of Abraham Amen. that would bring in the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. Amen. That's true. But anyway, he says, they broke my covenant. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Now, as I said, I love the book of Jeremiah. And I think any saint of God ought to spend a long time with Jeremiah on your knees, 
uh, sharing his tears, for it is a tear-stained book. Uh, and in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, there are one of the many statements in Jeremiah about his sadness. Uh, and he said here, Oh, that my head were a fountain of waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of my people. Well, if you are dealing with children today, or their parents, and that includes most people. <laughs> most people are either children or parents of somebody. Uh, but uh, uh, you find that we live in a time of divorces and breakups, crime, lawlessness, and the, little th and the things our children are going through nowadays should make us weep like Jeremiah weeps. And I think Jeremiah would weep over our generation very, very agonizingly. We pick up a lot of kids at North Joplin Church where I go, and it shocks you to hear a little girl say, Daddy hit mother with a hammer. Or Mama's in jail, and she was doing drugs again and the children are with the grandparents. Well, Jeremiah said, oh, that my eyes, my head were waters, mine eyes a fountain of tears, and I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet, and yet he has some very glowing words of hope in his book, too. In fact, some of the most glowing words of promise in the Old Testament prophets are in Jeremiah in spite of the fact that he is the weeping prophet. Now, the time of the, uh, uh, the time of the passage that we're dealing with today, and I'd like to have you kind of go back to Jeremiah 31. The time of it is right after the uh, second captivity of the Jews. Now, just a few of the Jews were snatched uh, back in 605 B.C. when they snatched uh, Daniel and who else? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We got them up here on the front row. <laughs> <laughs> or if you prefer Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you like to be a Hebrew instead of a Babylonian, why, uh, we can be that. Okay. Uh, and there were a few hostages taken back in 605, but in 597... In, at the end of the three months' reign of King Jeconiah, Nebuchadnezzar was mad. He was up to here. And he said, I'm going to get that creep off the throne. Uh, and uh, he came to Jerusalem. Now, King Jeconiah was a teenage polygamist. He was an 18-year-old polygamist with servants. Now, talk about a spoiled brat. Can you imagine an 18-year-old having wives and servants and being king? Now, that's too good to get to enjoy very long. <laughs> and his privileged position lasted three months. And Nebuchadnezzar came in and said, stick out your hands. And he shackled him and hauled him off to Babylon. Along with 10,000 other people, the prophet Ezekiel and Kish, the great-grandfather, of whom? I've been teaching Old Testament history too long. Kish, the great grandfather of Mordecai, the cousin of Esther, who raised her. Okay, that's uh, kind of the time of this thing, of this passage right here. And the passage that we're dealing with today, Jeremiah 31, is part of a block of about five or six chapters here that were a part of letters sent by Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon. Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem, and he sent letters to the captives in Babylon. And I'm going to read a few excerpts from this historical background of the passage. And I'd like to have you go back to um, Jeremiah chapter 29.
Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're told here, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive. And basically, Jeremiah said, you folks behave yourselves as good citizens. Don't be trying to start any bombings of airplanes. Uh, don't be uh, committing any terrorist organizations. You don't have to join a militia, and you don't have to get a cellar full of assault weapons. You are people of peace, and you're people of God. In the words of Jesus, you're not to take up the sword, so you won't perish by the sword. Our weapons are not carnal. But our weapons are strong to the casting down of evil imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God. Amen. Jeremiah talked along that vein. Notice in Jeremiah 29.5, build houses, dwell in them. Don't go out on a rampage. Plant gardens, eat their fruit. Take wives, beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons. Verse 7, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. Now that was the city of Babylon. Wicked, wicked city. Sort of like Baghdad, only more so. <laughs> Pray for the peace of Baghdad and Tehran and Tripoli and Jerusalem and Riyadh and the many other places. Pray for the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. We Christians don't have any business joining some kind of militant revolutionary groups. Amen. We are the people of peace Amen. and our gospel is a gospel of peace. Amen. Jeremiah knew that a long time ago because he spoke the word of the Lord. Well, that was Jeremiah's advice. But he did say in this chapter 20, verse, uh, 10, 29, verse 10, Thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and will perform that which I have promised. And then he says, don't worry, in verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Amen. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I'm not trying to hurt you. I have some people that I talk to that, man, you'd think God was trying to hurt them. <laughs> I, I'm thinking thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future. Now, if you're doing drugs, doing alcohol, doing tobacco, doing lustful things, you have no future but death, for the soul that sinneth it shall die. Another prophet said that, Ezekiel. Only God said it. And he said, then you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Well, that was part of Jeremiah's advice. And he goes on in the next chapter, chapter 30. And in chapter 30, he prophesies the return from captivity. And he says that after the return, well, I'd like to have you look at chapter 30 now, verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, and he's basically referring to the day that they came back from Babylon and the period after that. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break his yoke from your neck. Now, I believe that God ordains armies and governments to defeat certain evildoers. I, I believe that. Uh, but that's the last desperate measure. Uh, God, God will usually fight our battles for us. Sometimes he lets wicked people destroy wicked people. There are examples of that in the Bible and in history. But he said, I will break his yoke from off your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. But they will serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them. Oh, King David is going to come back to life at the time of Jeremiah. 
David had been dead uh, over 300 years. <laughs> he wasn't very frisky uh, just at that time. And David is coming back. Yes, David is coming back in the person of his offspring. And another 600 years later, the Lord would speak to a woman in Bethlehem saying, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And you will call his name Jesus. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Israel forever. Wow, that's great. So, Jeremiah was privileged to see the reign of Christ. Now Christ established his kingdom on earth. Beginning back in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. I know that his kingdom is eternal. I know it has a heavenly aspect. But there are just so many verses that teach us that the kingdom of Christ, at least at this present time, is practically the same thing as the church. Mark 9, 1, Jesus said, There are some of you who stand by me to, right now while Jesus was living that will not die until they see the kingdom of God come in power. And all those people are dead long ago. <laughs> so the kingdom was going to be established, and it was established. And John says in the book of Revelation to us that he has made us partakers in the kingdom and in the tribulation and patience. So we are partakers of this. And David's son, Jesus, is the king. Well, now... Uh, in, uh, in this chapter, in, in this, in this ch well, we're going on into the 31st chapter now. In this 31st chapter, God talks about some of his past kind acts. Look, please, at chapter 31, verse 2. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest, well, sadly, all but two of that first generation perished by the sword or by the plague. That is, the generation that went out of Egypt with Moses. But those who entered the promised land uh, got a kind of rest, not a perfect rest. And the book of Hebrews talks about that. It says if Joshua had really given them rest in the land of Canaan, he would not afterwards have spoken about a future rest when they were already in the land of Canaan. And long after they had entered the land of Canaan, God said, they're not going to enter my rest. Well, if Canaan had been the rest, they would have already entered it. There remaineth a rest for the people of God. Amen. Come unto me, the Lord says, and I will give you rest. And there's even more to come. Blessed are the dead. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. And this is real. And their works do follow them. Amen. That's true. So, God says, I gave you rest. And in verse 3, he says, well, I'm losing my marbles and my papers all over the place here. You don't want to look out for my marbles when you get out to walk. Uh, you may think you've gone flip-flop. You're in the Olympics or something. Other. Uh, anyway, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. The Lord appeared to me of old, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to me, uh, not with jerks, not with uh, um, ta uh, rough tugging. I have drawn you, and again, I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt. And so God spoke about his everlasting love, and he also spoke about how Israel would be regathered again. Now, this whole passage has sort of a... Uh, of a uh, messianic age flavor 
And there are several verses that pop up in here that point to the Messiah. Uh, for example, in uh, 3115, and we're getting around to our text eventually. <laughs> it's, uh, this uh, passage in Jeremiah uh, is an apple of gold in a network of silver. Uh, they're just beautiful silver framing all around this passage. <laughs> and right now I'm just trying to give you some of the silver framing and we'll get around to the golden apples here pretty soon, I hope. But uh, anyway, in chapter 31, verse 15, thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. Refusing to be comforted for her children. They are no more. Now you know where the New Testament applied that passage, don't you? To the slaughter of the innocent babes of Bethlehem. Whom Herod went to kill when he could not find the Christ. So this has, th this chapter has references to uh, the times of the Messiah. And he points to a time when there's going to be a whole new arrangement. And he says here in chapter 31, verse 22, about the Israelites, how long will you get around? One party to another. Oh, you backsliding daughter. The Lord has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. This is one of the really, really tough verses. Now, the Bible has some very difficult verses in it. This is one of them. Some people have said this refers to the virgin birth. I don't think so because it doesn't say a woman shall encompass the man. The Hebrew doesn't have an article. And a woman conceiving a child is nothing particularly unusual. It happens a few million times every day. <laughs> but what he seems to say here is that there's going to be a radical change. I think this passage refers to God as the husband and father. He's been referring to himself here as the husband. And Israel is often referred to as the bride. In fact, Jeremiah, just talking about this, he says... The woman will encompass the man. Israel is going to grab hold of God. They're not going to run from God anymore. They're going to seek their God. They're going to embrace God. This is not a figure of birth. It's a figure of affection. Amen. Now my interpretation is not heresy. I found it in Kyle and Delich. I found it in Ellicott. <laughs> it, it didn't come from thin air quite. But I wonder... If there has been a real change in you and me, are we still running from God? Or are we wanting to, like Mary Magdalene, throw our arms about his feet and seek the Lord? The woman, the church, shall encompass the man, our heavenly, our heavenly husband, our Christ, who's the bride. I think that's what that means. But then... In that very passage, he says, Behold, the days are coming when I'm going to make a new covenant. Yes, things are going to be different. <laughs> and he says here many things about this new covenant. He talks about being a husband to them here in verse 33. My covenant at Mount Sinai they broke. You know, they made the golden calf within 40 days of the time that they had heard the Ten Commandments spoken with God's PA system turned up until you <laughs> closed your ears. I don't like to get in a building where they knock my eardrums clear out uh, with the PA system, uh, especially not with the music. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, I, uh, God had given them the Ten Commandments. They'd made the golden calf and had broken God's covenant. And God says, I'm going to put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. They will be my people. And no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. 
Well, basically what I, I want to say in the remainder of what I, time I have, I want to talk about what does, what, what is meant by knowing the Lord and what is, oh, sorry, I'm getting it backwards. What is not meant by they shall all know the Lord and what is meant by they shall all know the Lord. That's a two-horned sermon. Now, it's not diabolical. It's just two horns. Uh, we hope it's the horns of a lamb and not the horns of uh, the beast or something or other or a goat. But what does it mean that they will not teach every man his neighbor, saying, know the Lord? Well, that does not mean that everybody is going to know the Lord. I find a lot of people today are practicing universalists. They don't believe anybody's lost. They don't believe anybody's going to hell. I heard a, fellow, a church member one time tell me that, said, well, uh, are there very many people going to be lost? And he said, oh, I don't think so. Well, now, don't, don't get the idea from this passage when it says they shall all know me that everybody is going to be a believer. That's not what this says. <laughs> not all people are believers. They don't all know the Lord. Some of them are like old Pharaoh. When Moses went to Pharaoh in Egypt and says, Thus says the Lord, let my people go into the wilderness that they may go on a three days journey and serve me. And Pharaoh says, Huh? I'm supposed to let you go. Because the Lord said so. Huh? I don't know, Lord, and I'm not going to let you go. And uh, that's trouble. A lot of people don't know the Lord, and they're proud of not knowing the Lord. They're not about to know the Lord. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. The Bible says they were sons of Belial, sons of the devil. They were, they were uh, wicked men. And it says they knew not the Lord. And uh, when the Bible says they will all know me, you have to realize that the term all in the Bible doesn't have the absolute meaning that the Greeks applied to it, and we have borrowed from the Greeks. Uh, the Bible says that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Well, you know very well that uh, the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out on all flesh. The apostles and 3,000 on the day of Pentecost started it, but uh, most of the people in Jerusalem didn't get the spirit. So, uh, Please uh, don't get the idea from this one. It says all, sh they shall all know me that, that everybody's going to be saved. Enter in by the narrow gate. Why? For narrow is the gate, I'm sorry, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads where? To destruction. And many there are, be, many there are that go in thereat. You know that passage back from, uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. Well, okay, what, what are we saying here? What does it mean, or what does it not mean when it says they shall all know me? Well, it doesn't mean everybody's going to be saved. Secondly, it doesn't mean that what everybody thinks is true is true. <laughs> I don't know anybody that doesn't think what he thinks is the truth. And most of you will, most of them will tell you so. If they can just hang on to you long enough to get you to listen. <laughs> Don't get the idea that what we think is true is necessarily God's truth. In the book of Judges, we're told about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the man Micah. And he hired a Levite for a priest. And he said, now I know the Lord will bless me, seeing I have a Levite for my priest. Well, he was about to find that uh, he was going to get his Levite hijacked and all of his idols with him, which might have been a blessing to him. <laughs> but uh, what we think is not necessarily God's truth. And we need to be very careful about making statements like, now God gave me this message. Or God gave me this song. Maybe God did. It's possible. But maybe you're trying to, uh, maybe you're trying to say more than you can really prove. That's for sure. Back in the book of Jeremiah, we're uh, 
in this same block of chapters. There was a false prophet back in chapter 28. Uh, I didn't read about him a while ago, Hananiah. And Hananiah came on the scene shortly after the people had been taken captive. And he had good news. He says, thus says the Lord, within two years all the captives will be brought back and all the vessels of the temple will be brought back. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, hallelujah. Uh, and uh, Jeremiah said back in chapter 28, uh, uh, in chapter 28, verse 12, now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. By the way, Hananiah spoke this prophecy in what is called the fifth month, which would be the month of March, according to the Jewish calendar. And uh, we read now what happened. 28, 12, now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah. He said, go tell Hananiah. Well, I'm going to skip down to verse 15. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You make this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will cast you off from the face of the earth. This year you will die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. Now that was in the fifth, uh, that was in the fifth month. March. Verse 17, so Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. I imagine people are going around saying that Jeremiah, uh, you better look out for him. <laughs> you don't want him uh, reading, your, uh, reading your future. Uh, you don't want him telling your future. But not everything that we think is necessarily something that God has taught us. We have to test all things. Be not many of you teachers, me included, for in many things we all stumble. Now the grace of the Lord overlooks our stumbling, but we cannot say from this verse when it says they shall all be, they shall be taught to, they shall not be taught to know the Lord because everyone will know him. You can't assume that everything you think is necessarily right. You have to test all things. That's what Paul told the Thessalonians. Test all things. Test what I'm saying. Tell me if I'm wrong. I may not enjoy it, but I need it. Uh, and I won't repeat it. Well, uh, Han and I was deceived. Uh, we read about other false prophets in uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29. Uh, look at 29, 15. Because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. The Lord had only raised up two prophets in Babylon. Who were they? Ezekiel and Daniel. They were it. Even Jeremiah didn't get to go to Babylon. <laughs> he stayed back in Jerusalem. But these guys, uh, they were false prophets. And we're told here in uh, this passage a little further along, like uh, uh, chapter 29, verse 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Coliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, who prophesy a lie to you in my name. They did it in God's name. Just because somebody comes on loud and strong, even louder than I come on, I'm not quite as bad as a preacher they used to call cannon mouth. Uh, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a preacher out in western Kansas and that's what they used to call him when he yelled everybody held their ears uh, but anyway even if a preacher yells it it doesn't have to necessarily be true so that's another thing that it does not mean when it says they shall all know me it doesn't mean that everything they know is necessarily right it does not mean that we don't have to study. Now I want you to look at this passage, Jeremiah 31, verse 34. I want you to look at it with me. We do have to study. We do have to read. 
Paul told the Ephesians, when you read, you may perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. That's Ephesians 3, 4. So when this says, they'll all be taught of the Lord, that doesn't mean that the Lord is going to open up your mouth, pour a gallon of knowledge down your craw, or open up the plug up here in your head and pour it in up here. Maybe that'd be the better place, especially if you've got a hole in your head. Uh, anyway, uh, but knowledge is not gained by the Lord pouring it into your head uh, miraculously, but it is gained by the study of God's word. Now back to this passage, it says in verse 34, no, man, no more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother. Now if you put a period right there, it would mean then, hey, they know everything, you don't have to teach them. It doesn't say you don't have to teach them. It says you don't have to teach them what? Know the Lord. That's what you don't have to teach them. There's oodles of stuff you better teach them. Oh, my. One thing that I've somewhat tried to do in teaching in Bible college is to give students a list of some of the most fundamental doctrines which they must teach their people or they're going to leave them so ignorant that they'll be blown around by any doctrine they hear. And there is a basic body of doctrine, the doctrine of God's character, God's law, the doctrine of Christ and his identity and his character, the teachings of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount and prayer, the origin of the church, those are basic things that we've got to teach our people, but it takes time and it takes commitment. It's easier to sing little silly songs about uh, some pet animal. Well, I've, I've got nothing against singing some fun songs sometimes, but we have so little time to teach our people. They're kind of like a flock of sheep that's running away from us. Uh, we have so little time to teach them that we better feed them though strong. We, well, if they won't eat anything but milk, give them that. But uh, feed them the strong meat if you can get them to eat it. We have a little girl that comes over to our house, and apparently she never gets to eat any meat at home. And we try to feed her some protein, and all she knows how to eat is French fries. Uh, I hope that doesn't mean she has uh, future cavities in her teeth or uh, uh, <laughs> rickets in her bones or something or that. But anyway. We have to read and study. Uh, this, these, this statement, they shall all know me, that does not mean that we don't have to read and study. The only thing we don't have to read and study is to know the Lord. Now here was the great difference between the covenant in the Old Testament times and the covenant now. In the Old Testament times, people were born into the family of God. God said to Abraham in Genesis 16, Behold, I establish my covenant with you. Every male shall be circumcised when he's eight days old. And if you don't have the sign of circumcision, you're cut off from my covenant. Well, of course, here's this little eight-day-old baby. Now, when the baby, as soon as he gets to talking, we would say, uh, Baby Johnny, I want to sing you a song about the Lord. And I think you ought to sing songs about the Lord to little children even before they can talk. Uh, they're learning it before they know how to say it back to you. They ought to hear you pray prayers. They ought to hear you sing songs about the Lord. And you'd be surprised as soon as they learn to talk. Why, uh, they've already got the uh, strings tuned in their brain. <laughs> and they'll play it back to you. <laughs> uh, with just a, I see some of you ladies have done this. God bless you. Uh, that's great. You know, baby Moses, he only got to stay in his mother's arms till he was probably weaned or a little older, maybe three years old or so. But during that time, he had learned about the Christ who was to come. So that when he became a man, he chose to suffer the reproach of Christ rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin that Egypt was so full of, which only lasted for a season. So uh, this... Uh, uh, th this passage right here then uh, teaches us that, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. In, in the Old Covenant, they had to be taught to know the Lord. And every little child stillborn 
has to be taught to know the Lord. But here's the difference. They were in the covenant from the time of their birth as children of Abraham. Under the new covenant, we are put into the, we are made the covenant people and we're put into the covenant fellowship at the time of our own personal decision. There's the difference. Here is the great difference between Roman Catholicism and its related religions and biblical Christianity. You're born into the church. You're sprinkled, baptized uh, when you're an infant. And then when you get a little older, well, then they teach you. That's just the opposite of what Jeremiah said, what God said through Jeremiah. He said they're not going to be teaching people who are in the covenant saying, know the Lord, for they're already going to know me. He didn't deny that they needed to be taught, but they weren't yet in the covenant until they'd made their own decision. Hang on to Jeremiah. We're, going to, we're not through Jeremiah 31 yet, but uh, I'd like to have you to... Uh, This will produce some interesting video. <laughs> oh, <anyway. laughs> uh, the pre preacher of the flying papers. Uh, uh, anyway, back in John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, or I shouldn't say back in it, I should say over in the gospel of John chapter 1, we're told that in John 1, 12, well, I'm going to begin with uh, verse um, 11. He, now this refers to Jesus. He came into his own. That is, he came, Jesus came to the world, was born of Mary, he came to his own, that is, his own people. Or he came to his own world, his own thing, his own place, his own possession. Uh, this refers to the realm. And those who were his own did not receive him. Now, the, the 12th verse is what I want you to hear. But as many as received him, Amen. to them he gave the right to what? To become sons of God. Even to, who were born, not of blood nor of the will of man. I skipped a line. Uh, he gave them the right to become children of God, even to those who what? Believe on his name. Who were born not of blood nor the will of the flesh. Uh, in other words, they didn't enter the covenant by the blood of circumcision or by uh, the parents deciding to have a baby, but they entered by their own choice. Not by the will of man, but by the will of God. Oh, we're going to hear some more about this in a minute. It is God's will that you be his child and that he take care of you. Amen. You were born by the will of God. Now, back to this passage, just make this point crystal clear right here, and I know most of you know this. But it says right here that we're born but it involves two things. It involves our receiving him and our believing upon him. Those are personal decisions. And it says that's a part of our being born. If you went on over into John 3, verses 3 and 5, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except what? A man be born again. Our being born again involves our personal receiving of Christ our personal believing upon him. So, because that's the nature of being in the new covenant, we don't have to teach people. We hope we don't have to teach people. Although in the book of Hebrews, he says uh, some of you need to go back and be taught uh, uh, the very elementary principles of the first principles. But that's not what God intended. God intended that the people of the new covenant would know the Lord, all of them. But then they had a whole lot of other things that they uh, needed to know also. Well, I've mentioned several things that uh, they, that statement, they will all know me, does not mean, here's another thing it does not mean, it does not mean that we know all the depths of God. 
we will never know all the depths of God. Uh, in, uh, in numerous places, like in the book of Romans, uh, the Apostle Paul, after talking about how that the Israelites were temporarily, temporarily separated from the Lord, uh, but that they would be restored, he said at the end of Romans chapter 11, Oh, the depth! of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his ways past finding out. So when it says they will all know me, that doesn't mean they're going to know everything about God. I don't know whether they'll ever know that or not. But apropos of this thought, I must interject this right here. I plan to anyway. This is not completely ad-lib, ad -lib, just partly. I believe that we're living to see the time when there are many Jews who are going to turn to the Lord who will help the Gentiles to know the Lord also. Amen. I have had the privilege of working with an Orthodox Jewish settlement in Israel where our archaeological dig is. Those people want to talk to us. They say, what's the difference between Protestant and Catholic? Why do you believe the Bible? Uh, and they, uh, in, in the latest issue of Biblical Archaeology Review, there was a full-page advertisement in there by a rabbi, and he wanted all his faithful Orthodox Jews uh, to write in for his book so that they wouldn't be converted by the missionaries, and he said, why have more Jews converted to Christ, to, converted to Christianity? He didn't say, con say converted to Christ, he said converted to Christianity. There's a difference. <laughs> in the last 19 years than in the previous hundred years, the rabbi is getting alarmed. They're turning to the Lord. Now, some of them still hate Jesus, but many of them are open. I sat down in the church of the Holy Sepulchre one day, and a fellow sat down in there all alone. I went over to him, and I asked him, I said, are you a believer in Jesus? Well, he said, I'm not sure. <laughs> he said, I'm a Romanian Jew. And, well, I figured I had a captive audience. <laughs> and I told him that he could believe in Jesus for his prophets had foretold what the Messiah would be like. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would give his life. He was there looking for Jesus, only he didn't know who he was. And he was having a hard time finding him in the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. <laughs> and if any of you have been in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, well, you know very well what I mean. But uh, anyway, God has a very deep plan, uh, and we will never know the depths of it. Well, maybe we ought to get off the negative now and go to the positive. We've talked about some of the things that it does not mean when it says they shall all know me. What does it mean? Well, it means that we will know, G we will know God as a living being. Jesus said, He that has seen me has what? Seen the, seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And uh, it, that's what knowing God means. They will all know Him because we have seen Him in our midst as Jesus. And Jesus was exalted before the nations. There is a majestic passage over in uh, uh, the first epistle of Timothy where uh, Paul described uh, the Christ and he says of Christ, God was manifested in the flesh. He was seen. He was justified in the spirit. Nobody could pin any evil on him. He was seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world. And so, it is true. All people know the Lord. The Jews thought they were going to get rid of Jesus, and the Romans thought they were going to get rid of Jesus. They were going to crucify him. Ha ha, that was, that was almost, well, I shouldn't be laughing, but that, that backfired in their face. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, what? I will draw all men to me. There is hardly a person in the world, if you mention Jesus, that doesn't say, oh yes, that's the guy who was put on the cross. The very action 
that was going to obliterate Jesus has exhibited him to the whole of humankind. Isn't that wonderful? And so back in Jeremiah, he said, they will all know me. There's hardly anybody that does not know of the crucified Christ. They may have very imperfect information, but they know a little bit. And so people have seen God and know God because of Christ's coming. Now, a second thing that this means is knowing God actually means being known by God. Amen. Now, if you're an English teacher, that's a very definite subordinate species. <laughs> uh, anyway, I taught English too long. Uh, anyway, but uh, you know the difference between active and passive verbs. Do we know God or are we known by God? I would like to have you look with me at, uh, at the passage in uh, Galatians 4.9. Galatians 4.9 where Paul says but now after you have known God or rather are known by God Amen. oh the difference is that God is reaching out for us instead of us reaching out to God. Oh, there are a few seekers in the world who are seeking after God. There are a few Corneliuses. <laughs> How many? <laughs> How many Roman soldiers came looking for Jesus? Oh, two or three. There are a few wise men who came looking for the baby. But sadly, there were more Herods than wise men. God is looking for us. He is seeking us. God was seeking me, I believe, before I was born. There were things that happened at the time of my birth, which snafu'd my getting a, a birth certificate later. All of this kept me out of the United States Air Force during World War II. I was half in. I had one foot in, and they were dragging the other foot. God caused me to meet certain individuals who directed me to go into his ministry. God was reaching out for me at a time when I didn't even care. God was reaching out for Jeremiah back in, before he was even born. Back in Jeremiah chapter 1, God said, Before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you a prophet. I made you a prophet to the nations. God is reaching out to you through your family, through your friends, through your church. God is reaching out to you and he is drawing you with the cords of love. Amen. We have not sought the Lord, but he has sought us. We have not chosen to wear his name, but our Lord is we are. He has put his name upon us. Amen. Oh, the glory of that thought. In the book of Acts, in Paul's sermon, uh, over in Acts chapter 13 it is, Paul mentioned this thought. Uh, in Acts chapter 14, in Acts chapter 14, in... Um, it, it, I'm sorry, it's Acts chapter 15. Well, I messed that up. Wasn't, this isn't Paul's sermon. This is Peter in the, in the Jerusalem conference. Peter says, he, he quotes here a passage from Amos. He says, uh, The rest of mankind should seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. God puts his name upon us so that we are marked and sealed as his own possession. Amen. God is seeking your hearts. He is knocking at your door. So yes, uh, it is true that we are known by, uh, that we 
we all know God because God knows us. Now, when you stop and think about it, it's not true to say that everybody knows God. But God knows everybody. So it is true, if you put that in the passive form, that everybody knows the Lord because the Lord knows everybody and he is reaching out to us. Now, it depends on your point of view. Do you start with God or do you start with man? Now, this is what it means. It means that we, knowing the Lord means that we see God in Jesus and that God is seeking us that we will be his children. Besides that, God gives to us an anointing that he refers to over in 1 John when he says, you have an anointing with God and know all things. And God will make our consciences tender, our heart willing, our, our minds believing, so that we will walk with the Lord. Amen. I close by reading from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. This is my covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord. They shall all know me, because I know them, and I'm looking for them. Thank you very much.